Good afternoon and welcome to Lahore School of Law's webinar on the topic of torture. Uh, Pakistan signed the International Convention Against Torture in 2008, and it was an expression of uh, 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 Pakistan's intention to uh, ratify the convention later on. Uh, two years later, Pakistan ratified the convention in 2010. Pakistan uh, was supposed to submit its uh, first initial report on the implementation of the convention in 2011, uh, which was submitted with quite, uh, quite a few years delay in 2016. Uh, and uh, during the, during the uh, report's review by the Com Committee Against Torture, which is uh, a, a committee constituted under the United Nations Convention Against Torture, uh, uh, the committee uh, made uh, quite a few significant recommendations in its concluding observations. Some of the recommendations were uh, to introduce a comprehensive definition of torture uh, as prescribed in the convention's uh, 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 content. Uh, and, and another was to review the legislative framework and make torture a criminal offense. Uh, then the committee also uh, recommended to Pakistan that training of police and prosecutors, judges, and other concerned authorities be taken up and uh, provide uh, other uh, adequate mechanism be provided for investigation and uh, remedy uh, for, for the victims of uh, torture by state agents. Uh, these uh, steps could have been implemented, these recommendations could have been implemented if Pakistan had taken up and uh, introduced uh, a new legislative framework, which has not been done. Uh, we have seen since the ratification of United Nations Convention Against Torture by Pakistan that number of private member bills have been introduced at different points of time in the last one decade or more. Uh, but uh, none of the bills have been taken up by the government of Pakistan and uh, seriously pursued and debated in the parliament. All those bills have so far lapsed. Uh, the latest such bill uh, was introduced by Senator Sherry Rahman, uh, uh, which is pending before the Senate uh, of Pakistan. And uh, the government claims since 2019 that Pakistan, uh, the government has been working on a draft bill. Uh, and in fact, the uh, 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 Minister of Human Rights has claimed, and probably some other uh, officials have also made the claim that the bill is almost ready to be presented uh, before the parliament. But that has not happened. Uh, so while the government of Pakistan has never introduced any bill in the parliament, uh, we uh, international pressure and uh, local civil society organizations have been demanding that the United Nations Convention Against Torture be implemented through uh, a, a, a comprehensive legislative framework. Uh, and this demand has been recently reiterated by Justice Project Pakistan and uh, uh, International Organization Against Torture, OMCT, uh, uh, through a brief which they released a couple of weeks ago. So today uh, we have to discuss United Nations Convention Against Torture's Im implementation in Pakistan. And uh, the reason uh, is uh, not just that Pakistan has not been able to implement this convention for a long time, but also that uh, we, we continue to see a surge in the incidents of torture and custodial deaths uh, by state agents in Pakistan. Uh, that has not stopped, though reporting has been uh, 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 not uh, great in this uh, respect, uh, uh, and we don't have very credible data available uh, with us. Uh, officially, Pakistan continues to deny that Pakistan uh, has a, a great problem to deal with so far as torture in Pakistan is concerned. So today we are going to discuss this issue with some of uh, the experts in the area. Um, and we have with us uh, Dr. Nicole Burley, who works with the United, uh, International Organization Against Torture as human rights uh, advisor. And we have uh, Ms. Rima Omar, who is a lawyer and International Commission of Justice's legal advisor for South Asia. 
Uh, we also have uh, uh, lawyer Fatma Bukhari, who is the executive committee member of Asia Al Alliance Against Torture. We also we are also fortunate to have with us former Senator Faratullah Babur Sahib, who uh, a few years ago presented his own bill uh, to to uh, to counter torture on uh, custodial deaths. Uh, uh, Faratullah Babur Sahib. Uh, I think your mic is mute. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, Thank we you. can. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nicole, for joining us. I start my uh, our discussion with uh, <laughs> some questions uh, uh, which I'm going to pose Dr. Nicole Burley. Uh, Nicole, uh, you have been following developments in Pakistan for more than five years. And you were also part of the discussion and review which took place before the Committee Against Torture in 2017. Uh, and you have recently uh, joined hands with Justice Project Pakistan uh, to issue the statement to uh, urge Pakistani government to introduce legislation. Um, uh, tell us something about international developments which have taken place in the last 10 years or so. And why is it uh, relevant to Pakistan? And tell us, is Pakistan a unique example in not uh, complying with international obligations so far as United Nations Convention Against Torture is concerned? Thank you so much um, for having me and uh, for your questions. Um, well, its implementation is, is very difficult for most countries um, around the globe, not um, even, in, even in many European countries we see that many countries lack um, relevant um, legislations. Um, in Asia, there are only three to four countries that actually have, um, have a law that's dedicated that, um, that criminalizes torture. Some, some have some sort of, uh, of a provision in their criminal code, um, but implementation is, is, implementation is difficult for, for, for all countries. Um, and of course, a law is very important, but um, this, is, this is not enough. Um, what's also really important is, um, is accountability. There's no way around um, accountability. Um, a law is important, but laws also need to be implemented. Perpetrators need to be held um, accountable. Um, they need to, be, need to be punished. There needs to be investigations and victims need to be able um, to, to get remedies. Yeah, so uh, while it is difficult, um, uh, why do you think, uh, why, how do you explain it has been difficult for Pakistan after initial interest being shown uh, in 2008 and then immediately ratifying in a couple of years time uh, the convention? I mean, it hasn't happened elsewhere uh, that uh, ratification followed si si signing of the convention. So in such, such a quick succession. Um... Well, a lot of a lot of countries um, ratify conventions before they have relevant laws, which is which is of course um, totally fine. One can uh, sign and ratify a convention and then follow through um, through with um, with with legislation. Um, it is um, well for for most countries. Um, it is difficult to enact laws um, because it concerns the police. It concerns potentially also the military and other government um, bodies. And um, many countries have difficulties in, in enacting laws that limits uh, police powers. Because what, we, what we're seeing, there's really an increase um, in countries using the police um, to strengthen their power. Um, governments do not see the police as service providers. Uh, the police themselves don't see um, don't see themselves as service providers. The community doesn't see themselves, doesn't see the police as um, service providers. It's more, they're more seen as an enemy. Um, and we also see um, in many countries in the region that there is a militarization of the police. Um, it's not rare nowadays that police wear camouflage um, and that they use military, military type of weaponry um, in, for instance, crowd control during demonstrations. Um, so many, many, especially authoritarian regimes um, use their police as a, as a tool to stay in power. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and it's not just uh, the authoritarian regimes uh, who are declared to be authoritarian or are uh, for some other significant procedural reasons uh, described so, uh, but uh, democratic regimes have also resorted to uh, tough uh, tactics so far as uh, policing is concerned. So, I mean, uh, when you say that militarization of police has happened in the last one or two decades time, uh, I mean, it has in, uh, increased many fold in the last one decade. Uh, uh, it has happened in the so-called democratic countries as well. And uh, we see that, uh, uh, I mean, quite frequently on our TV screens, how the police deals with crowds, for instance. Um, uh, but uh, we have also, uh, I think, uh, uh, been experiencing um, uh, tides of uh, the phenomenon, which is usually referred to as terrorism. And uh, governments have been reluctant also probably uh, because they uh, see uh, a, a legislative framework to con counter torture uh, as, a, as, a, as also a prohibition on uh, government's ability, the police authorities' ability to counter terrorism. Uh, is that also uh, how you see it? Yes, absolutely. Well, I wanted to, to, to refer to your first point. You're absolutely right. Um, what I've said also applies to many democratic countries, even in Europe, we, we see this. And when I said the, um, the use of military, military type of weapons and, weapons and crowd controls, um, we've seen this um, a lot in Europe and also Latin America, the US. Um, there, there seems to be um, a democratic crisis generally around the globe. You know, the right to fair elections, freedom of the press, rule of law, they're deter deteriorating in many countries, including in Asia, and activists and human rights defenders who criticize the government, who speak out against torture, they're, they're threatened, they're killed, they're detained. Um, so in many countries, the separation of power only exists on paper. Um, even in stable democracies, as you said, um, we see that the executive severely limits important checks and balances and um, and this, this, of course, inevitably comes with the limitation of human rights for the people. And this also means that human rights treaties, including the Convention Against Torture, are not um, properly implemented. Um, and you're also right that countries have a, um, that, um, that do f um, where terrorism is a real problem, the, those countries also have a hard time um, implementing international conventions, convention against torture, and enacting relevant laws. Mm. Yeah. So um, um, one uh, other question, relevant question would be, uh, because we have been talking to uh, governmental authorities in various seminars and discussions, and um, among the other reasons w which they cite uh, for, for, for uh, being unable to enact a law, uh, it has been among so many others, that uh, they do not have all the resources and the ability and the capacity to implement the convention. I mean, this is something which they privately say, uh, but I, I don't know how fair is this uh, reason, uh, but this is something which we can come back to later on in our discussion. Um, I would also like to explore some other areas with you, Nicole, later in the discussion. Uh, we now have with us uh, our, um, our third panelist, Fatma Bukhari. Um, uh, Fatma, uh, 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 Faraz Saab, allow me to uh, uh, raise a couple of questions with Fatma, and then I'll come to you uh, uh, okay. to to uh, to ask uh, uh, to to know learn about your experience in the parliament. Uh, Fatma, can you tell us something about uh, the pending uh, uh, draft bill in the Senate, which Senator Shari Rahman has introduced, and before that, we have had a few other bills as well. Uh, how do you view them? Uh, do you think that these bills, uh, the, the one which is pending right now and the ones which have left in the parliament, uh, were they good enough? Are, is the bill which we have in the Senate, is that a good bill? Thank you, Asad Saab. Um, so I think at this stage, uh, given, you know, the level of impunity and, you know, the scale of uh, torture and other forms of ill treatment that we have, um, and just the legal vacuum that is present, um, any legislative attempt to kind of bring, um, you know, this, this thing under a legal kind of a framework is, is welcome. 
Um, so that's that's the broader sense in which um, I'm taking the legal developments that have come uh, forward from the parliament to kind of legislate on this important issue, which is very difficult in the in both the regional and international context, as has been highlighted. So at the outset, um, having said that, I think when we go into the individual provisions, there's much to be discussed and much to be refined. And of course, you know, in many jurisdictions, the laws have been gradually updated, implemented, uh, you know, in a, you know, in, in a way, in a pilot way to see what the gaps are, where they fit in. So I think that is also something that we kind of have to um, kind of anticipate from the beginning that the law is not a fix all problems kind of a solution in, in this area. It's it's a step in the right direction. And uh, we'll, we'll see, as we see in context of other regions in the same region, for example, in South Asia, in other countries where uh, criminal legislation has come uh, to surface, which has very ambitious provisions, we see serious gaps in implementation. So the wording of the law itself, um, you know, is just part of uh, what we have to assess when we're looking at uh, this broader area. So very briefly to, uh, to, to speak about um, the current pe pending bill, um, which of course we again are not very hopeful that is, is making it. Uh, but fingers crossed that you know this this continues uh, in the right direction. There have been developments uh, with regards to the definition, which is more comprehensive on torture. Um, so uh, the definition that is provided in the latest bill by uh, Senator Sherry Rahman encompasses uh, key elements, uh, which I buy um, uh, the Committee on Torture. So for example, uh, understanding um, aspects of discrimination, which increase vulnerability for certain segments of society to torture, um, as one of the reasons um, that is part of the definition, um, you know, torture on the basis of discrimination, it's, it's very important to reflect that psychological torture, uh, other forms of torture, you know, broader definitions of what it means to be in custody, uh, what it means, you know, notions of uh, command responsibility, where officials cannot um, absorb themselves of responsibility when they have uh, the responsibility to monitor their subordinates or, you know, institutions that work under their mandate. These are important provisions. For example, provisions on punishments, even, for example, there's a, a committee recommendation that there should be protocols for suspension and transfer of uh, relevant officials uh, who are under investigation or against whom a complaint has been lodged. These are important provisions that the new bill looks at uh, when we talk about serious sexual violence and uh, you know the particular risk to women that is also covered under the new law and this is this is all important and of course maybe there's not enough time to go into a detailed provision but I think overall uh, the legislation does codify important uh, protections which are necessary in, in furtherance of our obligation under the international framework um, and you know what we have uh, already ratified to. Um, one of the concerns that I do have that I want to flag and maybe we can talk about this later uh, as well in the discussion is that the new I think one of the most important things after the definition of torture itself is basically the accountability framework that any legislation puts forward that is who will be responsible for conducting an effect, effective and adequate investigation in a prompt manner and is that independent institution um, first of all there in the legislation and in your legal system or in your social context um, so for example, in this uh, new law, we already know that the earlier laws mentioned, um, you know, the Federal Investigation a Agency as uh, the competent authority to take up these investigations. And the committee has raised concerns about the independence of FIA as an institution to prosecute and investigate uh, effectively police officials. Now, the new law does try to add a layer of oversight by making the sessions court the original a uh, kind of forum where a complaint will be lodged. And then the National Commission on Human Rights uh, also has a part to play in the oversight function. However, it will be important for us to kind of uh, assess uh, the interrelationship between these three different um, you know, forums and how they will work together to bring 
bring forward uh, some kind of a coherence seen in other jurisdictions when we look at best practices is that overlapping mandates, overlapping jurisdictions uh, between different entities can cause problems with regards to accountability and also in just in terms of monitoring and also access for, for people. So this is a question that maybe I can throw out there and we can discuss it later, is that do we think that the session court is sufficiently empowered uh, to be able to provide that um, you know, independent forum which can in effectively investigate uh, these crimes? And similarly, we've seen in our previous context that the National Commission on Human Rights, which is an important institution, was not sufficiently resourced, not sufficiently um, given, um, you know, the powers that it requires to do this. So when assessing, you know, these arrangements that are present in the law, it's also important to look at, do we have the same budgetary allocations, resource allocations, or just the transfer of power that is necessary to do this. So this is something I think at an earlier stage, I want to highlight for discussion, that I think merits uh, more introspection, that whether the you know, legal framework for accountability, the complaint mechanism is likely to generate the results uh, that we have. And I'm happy to share recommendations on this uh, at a later stage. Yeah, I think a relevant question uh, would be that whether FIA should be assigned this kind of a mandate, uh, because FIA is a federal body, federal institution, and uh, torture happens at all levels. So what would be the most appropriate, which institution would be the most appropriate institution, uh, whether it exists or not, whether we have to uh, found yet another new institution for the accountability, uh, and before that, uh, investigation of torture um, at, the, at the provincial levels, at the district level. So uh, probably uh, uh, this needs to be um, uh, really uh, reconsidered in a very, very serious manner. <clears throat> Yes, I think we will definitely come back to this question um, about resources, institutions, their overlapping role and accountability, and of course, in investigation. Uh, we you now also have uh, our, with us uh, our th fourth panelist, Reema Omar. Um, uh, let me ask you, Reema, since you have uh, heard Fatma talking about uh, legislative framework, which has been proposed uh, by Senator Sherry Rahman, um, what is the regional experience in this regard? Uh, uh, what about other South Asian countries uh, who have shown their intention by signing the convention or by ratifying the convention? Uh, I understand they, there is no uh, law in India as well. And uh, implementation of uh, accountability mechanisms to, uh, to counter torture uh, is missing in other uh, con regions, countries, uh, how do you view this development? Okay, thank you so much, Asad. Um, yes, I mean, in South Asia, let's just stick to South Asia as a region. We see so many different examples. You rightly pointed out India does not have a law on torture at all. Uh, they have been drafts that they've been considering, but um, those drafts too have had problems, but they haven't passed any laws yet. Uh, interestingly, we have um, Nepal recently changed its penal code and recognized torture as a distinct criminal offense. So we have that model where they don't have a standalone law on torture, but the penal code recognizes torture as a criminal offense. We have uh, Sri Lanka, which has a standalone law on torture, uh, and that uh, seeks to um, implement the Convention Against Torture in Sri Lanka's domestic uh, framework. And then Bangladesh also has a standalone law on torture. Unfortunately, I mean, in Pakistan, of course, we're uh, still many steps behind where these countries are, but they don't really show much promise, to be very honest with you. Though I do think laws play many different roles and just having a law on torture, at least symbolically, uh, recognizes that the state considers a particular offense to be serious enough to be criminalized and the state considers torture to be a crime. And just that recognition, I think, has some uh, symbolic value. Uh, but in terms of whether it's been these laws have been able to prevent torture, which I think is an important 
consideration alongside accountability uh, when we speak about torture? Not really. I mean, you don't see that much change in the prevalence of torture since these laws were enacted in these three countries. Nepal, of course, it's too soon to say. It's just been a couple of years since they changed their penal code. The second question on accountability, we've seen some convictions, but not too many. So uh, what Fatma was talking about earlier is very pertinent. What kind of an independent investigating and prosecuting agency or institution do we need to ensure accountability happens? Um, so, and has have laws called cultural shifts in how we view torture as a society? I mean, uh, that I think is very important as well. And have states been able to uh, take these laws to the people and sort of change that mindset, that attitude? I think that also remains to be seen. Um, in terms of uh, account, different measures uh, or, uh, that one can have for accountability. I mean, let's just not look at criminal accountability. That's, of course, is the first thing that comes to mind. And torture is a serious human rights violation. Uh, there is no alternative to criminal accountability in that sense. But you also have to think about um, redress in a broader way. I mean, for example, compensation, rehabilitation for the victim, um, support in terms of financial support after they are uh, you know, uh, out of custody or detention. So this is also something I would like to uh, see conversation about in Pakistan. Um, we have seen some success in this. In Nepal, for example, the torture compensation law that they have, they have quite a um, success rate under that law is quite high. In a large number of cases, victims have gotten compensation, which is some sort of a recognition on the state's part that their personnel have been involved in something illegal or unlawful. However, uh, when it comes to criminal accountability, we don't see the same uh, translating there. So it also shows that states are uh, protective of their own agents, of their own people. Um, and in many cases, people are actually pursuing an agenda that is of the states, right? So to expect the state to hold criminally accountable its own people, which in some cases may be, may be carrying on the state's own agenda, of course, seems very, very difficult. Um, so I would just like to introduce these different factors. And again, South Asian countries have different experiences. If you only look at criminal accountability, we don't see that much success uh, and much for Pakistan to learn from. Uh, when it comes to um, compensation, maybe the Nepal model is something that we can look at. Um, uh, but yeah, I think we have to also look at prevention, which in Pakistan's context is very important uh, because I mean, if you have, do we have access to detention centers, to prisons? Uh, are people only confined or detained in acknowledged places of detention? Um, all of these questions need to be asked. So I get a bit, um, you know, concerned when we hear criminalized torture, you know, on social media, in our advocacy, it, that would just be very incomplete. I mean, we have to break down what criminalizing torture means. And we have to consider all these elements that other panelists have also raised um, in today's discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Reema. This is a very, very important uh, dimension which you have introduced to the discussion. And I think uh, criminalized torture is a kind of a slogan. Uh, sure. And since we are used to, uh, you know, uh, yes. raising slogans, uh, so it, it sure. matters, it matters. Sure. Uh, let, sure. me, let me go to Faratullah Babar Saab to share with us his experience uh, uh, regarding legislation on torture. And since he has also been uh, one of the moving forces behind, uh, you know, uh, introduction of the National Commission on Human Rights Bill in the Parliament mm -hmm. and uh, a few other bills which he later on withdrew. And that those bills were also meant to hold the state agents accountable. Uh, Faratullah Babar Sahib, uh, can you share with us why the reasons why, you, why, why do you think uh, Pakistan has not been able to introduce a comprehensive legal framework? And then we will go to the details. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jamal. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very important question that you have asked as to why Pakistan has not been able to fulfill and also to implement its international obligations under the Convention Against Torture. 
I would like to share with you uh, my thoughts and perceptions on this. Well, as we all know that Pakistan signed, ratified the Convention Against Torture, which obligates us to make domestic legislation. The past over now 10 years, it has been done. A, a law, a private member bill was actually passed by the Senate also in 2015. In March 2015, a private member bill. All the 100 members of the Senate endorsing it, all the provinces of Pakistan and all the political parties of Pakistan endorsing it. It is transmitted to the National Assembly also. Thereafter, it disappears in thin air. There is a bill now by Sherry Rahman also. And uh, torture continues to take place. The government has promised, and I believe that the Minister for Human Rights is a very honorable person. And when she promised that, yes, the bill is under consideration, she means that. But if she means that, and for the last now almost 30 months, uh, it has still not seen the light of the day. So there must be, Asad Jamal Sahib, there must be some reasons as to why, in spite of the state signing and ratifying, in spite of the bill having been passed, in spite of the genuine promises of the present government, and in spite of so many governments have been, having gone uh, th through the stage during the last decade, it has not been done. Uh, let us uh, call a spade a spade. And let us not miss words, because unless you are able to identify the problem, we will not be able to address it. In my view, the problem really is the unaccountable security apparatus of Pakistan in a country where the premier intelligence agency of Pakistan is not under any law. And I don't say it on my own. In reply to a question in the parliament as to whether the ISI functions under a certain, under a law or not, and if it functions under a law, please provide a copy of the law so that we can have a look at it. And if not, if there is no law, the question is, why not? Asad Jamal Sahib, in reply to this question, the formal reply of the state, of the government was, this is secret, sensitive. So in a country where, where the member of the parliament demands copy of the law under which the premier security agency operates, and the parliament is told it is secret and sensitive. So why I say this? I say that, you know, torture is taking place in the police stations, in all the lockups, whether the department which is maintaining the lockup is provincial or, or the federal torture is taking place. But one particular area where torture is taking place, which has still not come to the fore, in public as much as the torture of the police comes to the fore, that is the internment centers set up in Pakistan's tribal areas and now in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And these internment centers are operated, manned and guarded by, by, by the military. And when I say, now torture is taking place there. And I say this torture is taking place because in 2019, in Peshawar High Court overturned the convictions of, this, of the large number of inmates of those uh, uh, internment centers because they said that all the confessions that you have obtained, and they give the argument, and it appeared to them that the confessions were identical, and it appeared that they were obtained under uh, torture. So the, the, the High Court overturned all the convictions. The High Court even uh, declared that the internment center should be handed over to police. That still has not taken place. And as a member of the parliament, when we ask that we want to visit the internment center just to see the conditions, after all, the internment centers have been set up under a certain regulation. And if that regulation is a product of the parliament or is the product of a presidential order, the members of the parliament should be able to visit. No. Members of parliament have not been allowed to visit the internment centers. And you take the case of, you, you mentioned the Justice Project of Pakistan. They carried out a study, and the study was just one district of Pakistan, Faisalabad. And they took up the data from 2006 to 12, 
as to uh, what is the status of the police torture in the police station, Faisalabad, and a very startling observation is made in that report, regardless of that 1400 cases of torture, not one in not in one case, you know, uh, a complaint has been lodged, no punishment. The startling thing in that report, in my view, was that the ANF, Anti-Narcotics Force, which is run by the military, when it was just sent a questionnaire to find out, as the questionnaire was sent to all the police, all the police departments, etc., when a questionnaire was sent to them, they did not bother to reply to that, or they didn't even acknowledge. So I think that the elephant in the room is the security establishment of Pakistan when the uh, when the premier intelligence agency is not under any law or at least that is what we know as a member of the parliament that no copy of the law under which it operates has been provided so i think that uh, that is the elephant in the room and as you ca carry the ca carry on the discussion forward i'll also then also like to make some recommendations as to how we can carry the discussion forward unfortunately the the criminal justice system in pakistan is broken. We have seen how people have been at the death rows even today. There's a news report of the Justice Project of Pakistan again, a, a juvenile on 28, for 28 years on death row and now but that thing has been overturned. So in a, in a broken criminal justice system, when the security establishment refuses to submit to accountability, refuses to submit to transparency, the issue of uh, uh, enforced disappearances, the issue of internment centers, the issue of torture will continue regardless of, regardless of uh, the attempts being made uh, at uh, making a law, even if the laws are made, I apprehend, even if the laws are made, uh, we unfortunately are very poor. Our record of implementing the existing laws is also very poor. Therefore, we have to look at it more closely, more deeply. But of course, the legislation is the first critical step because once the legislation has been made, thereafter, if torture takes place, at least anybody in the parliament or anywhere else, the voices can be raised and those voices will serve in the presence of the law on torture, those voices will serve as a megaphone. Right now, no voices are raised because there is no law, nobody says. Nobody says what law has been contravened through tar by by inflicting torture on anybody. So I think that we must clearly identify the sources uh, and the reasons why the anti-torture legislation has been thwarted. Pakistan has not succeeded in passing anti-torture legislation for the last decade. To sum it up, I would say. In my mind, the elephant in the room is the security establishment of Pakistan and the premier intelligence agency of Pakistan. Let us admit it. Once you admit this, only then can you proceed further. Thank you. Thank you, Babur Sahib. Look, Babur Sahib, Reema Omar and Fatima Bukhari, I think both of them have referred to the cultural dimension of torture, how it is culturally acceptable in Pakistan and the region uh, of South Asia. Um, uh, and then there is the political culture, uh, cultural dimension uh, to this uh, whole issue. Um, so, uh, for instance, let me go back uh, to 2012 when national uh, the legislation the draft bill on a national commission on human rights was introduced and in that bill too uh, the amendments were made to exclude from the scope of accountability uh, by the national commission on human rights uh, of the of the security establishment so i think uh, the parliament has also been uh, uh, flexible uh, if not outrightly uh, submissive uh, toward the uh, white, uh, toward the elephant in the room, which you have been referring to. So it is also about the politics of the country, the 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 equation which is which uh, in which we don't see the balance. Uh, I think the political culture also needs to be developed uh, in order to enable uh, any sitting government to implement its political intentions. Uh, yes, uh, Asad Jamal, this uh, very. Uh, perceptive observation that political parties 
political culture also has permitted. But let me uh, put it in correct perspective. When the NCHR bill was being debated, and of course, this was an issue that what about the military authorities and the security establishment? If you see the law, uh, the, the apprehensions of the security establishment were addressed to a certain point, but they have not been given complete uh, carte blanche. For example, uh, this internment center that which, which I talked about, they have been, they have been uh, set up under regulation called Action in Aid of Civil Power Regulation 2011 and now 2018. Now in 2011, uh, it was the PPP government and uh, uh, you would necessarily like to know as to what had happened. Why did we allow this law to be passed? Uh, the internment centers law about, with respect to the tribal areas was pa passed and it had to be signed by the president because under the constitution at that time, the president was empowered to legislate for the tribal areas. The rationale, the reason for that, as Jamal Saab was, a large number of people had disappeared in Malakand and Swat in the operation against militants. And the government really was very concerned that they must be brought out. And therefore, this particular law was the result of that concern. So when the law was made, the regulation, the security establishment said, well, if now we follow this law, we have people with us in our custody, even in from 2010 and from 2009 and from 2008. And if you make this law now, uh, we will be exposed uh, to uh, the mischief of the law. Well, now you can say the PPP government should not have acceded to this or the other point of view was, okay, this is your concern. So the action in aid of civil power regulation 2011 will be made applicable from retrospective effect 2008. Now it is a judgment call whether we should have allowed a retrospective effect or we should have insisted that no, from 2011 onwards, and if you have people in illegal custody, then you face the music. I think at that time, the government decided, no, let us accommodate the viewpoint of the security establishment, but in return, we will have these people out and they will be tried. But what happened? That calculation, uh, it proved to be miscalculation. Internment centers were set up. The people who had been uh, disappeared, they were put into the internment centers. Till today, we don't know how many internment centers, how many prisoners in each internment center, uh, what are the charges against them, what is the nature of the uh, of, of the trial, if at all, is taking place, whether they, they are the families are allowed to visit them or not. So. So even if the parliament and even if a political government under compulsion made some compromise in the hope that, well, it will eventually lead to, you know, correcting the entire thing, it did not happen. Therefore, now similarly in the case of NCHR, the National Commission of Human Rights, there's no carte blanche to the security establishment. There is this provision that uh, if there is a complaint against that intelligence agency or the military and thing, the chairman of the NCHR will write to them a letter and then the, 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 he will get a reply and something like that. You know, but there is, there is some check, not adequate, not as much as we would want. Asad Jamal Sahib, you would be surprised to know when the enforced disappearances case came up before our committee, the Human Rights Committee, uh, we said, look, what is the issue? The issue is that uh, the Commission on Enforced Disappearances tells us that oh, we have discovered, we have found out, we have traced 3,000 disappeared people and they are either now in jail or they are being tried. The chairman was asked, sir, you have, thank you very much, you have been able to locate more than 3,000 people, but tell us, did you ask anyone as to who had kidnapped him? where he had been kept, what happened to him, was he tortured? And the standard answer was, well, whenever we asked them, they would say, no, please don't ask this question. I'm back and I'm in jail or I'm okay, etc." And we said, look, Mr. Chairman, the law says that you have to investigate and prosecute the perpetrators. If 3,700 people have been traced 
And in not one case has the commission been able to uh, investigate and prosecute the, the perpetrator, then something is wrong. And if something was wrong, you should have come to the parliament. Therefore, Asad Jamal sahab, we suggested, okay, what we will do is that the parliament committee will invite some of those people who had disappeared and have been, have been traced. If they want to come and testify before us, we will assure them, assure, assure, give an assurance that no harm will come to you. And meeting with them will be on camera. It will not be made public. We will listen to them. We will hear their point of view. And then the committee will make its report. It will be a sealed report. It will be given to the chairman of the Senate. And then let the chairman of the Senate, after seeing that report, decide on his own whether he wants to uh, summon the chief of the intelligence agency or whatever, so that the whole thing will be done in a manner that you don't embarrass the security agencies, but at the same time, you open the door. We tried, we failed. That is why I say that the elephant in the room is the security establishment. Not that the political parties have failed or that they have not tried. So therefore, we have really to address this issue very earnestly. If the parliament makes a suggestion that, all right, let us talk with these uh, affectees, these disappeared people, listen to them, maybe they disclose certain things, and maybe we can take the conversation from that point onward. And it was not, uh, it was uh, uh, in camera. It, it was supposed to be in camera, not public so that nobody is embarrassed. And even this is not allowed. And this is the kind of culture. This, this is not political culture. This is the security culture. Because Pakistan is a security-driven state. It is not a welfare-driven state. When we were, I was the chairman of the committee on the right to information law, RTI. And when we were uh, making this law, and thank God that finally the law now is in place. And we said that, all right, uh, we are making this law, but uh, which is the most uh, affected department which is reluctant to share the information, and that is the Minister of Defense. Therefore, as chairman of the committee, we wrote to the Minister of Defense that please uh, depute somebody that should come and talk with us um, because we are working on the draft right to information law. And do you know, Mr. Jamal Sa, what was the reply? The reply came from the Minister of Defense signed by a section officer. And the section officer says, this is a very serious matter. And therefore the committee should not proceed until an NOC has been issued by the Minister of Defense. Now imagine a parliamentary committee being told by a section officer that wait for an NOC from us before you proceed further, to which we said nothing doing and the law was passed. The point I really want to make is that there is political will. It may not be as much as strong as you would wish it to be. But again, I would say with great respect to all these, the elephant in the room is the security establishment. Thank you very much, Baba Saab. Um, I'll return to you maybe on another aspect of uh, the legislation. Uh, let me go back to Nicole and Rima and Fatma. Uh, to discuss um, uh, in a short time, which we are left with, uh, a couple of things at least. Uh, and and uh, one important dimension of any law would be investigation. Uh, which agency in Pakistan, which institutions should, should be given the responsibility to investigate torture? Should it be just one agency? Should it be a federal crime? Uh, or should it be implemented, the convention should be implemented at various uh, different tiers of the Federation of Pakistan. Uh, Rima, what, what opinion do you have on this question? And uh, do you think that we need to have uh, multiple layers of accountability as uh, is the case, uh, uh, as is the proposal uh, given in the uh, Senator Sherry Rahman's bill? Asad, this is something I've been struggling with for many years myself. I do not have a clear-cut answer to this. I mean, uh, I it's easier to critique the various proposals that are put forward, but coming up with an alternative proposal that um, 
it to me is is difficult and i think on this perhaps we need to have broader consultations at a provincial level as well as at a federal level and see what would work but i do not think the federal investigating agency and the national commission for human rights i mean the national commission of human rights has barely been functional for the past couple of years since the first term of their members expired so i mean already in body a body that is struggling to to work to survive uh giving it such so much power uh, i mean this responsibility and additional responsibility i'm uncomfortable with this same with the sessions courts i mean so i think this is something we need to have a broader debate on um i do not have a uh, an answer for for this unfortunately yeah i think uh, let me put it um, that mm. the session scores is part of the judiciary and i don't think uh, that uh, judiciary should be uh given the responsibility uh, at at the investigation stage or uh, yeah. even for administrative purposes i don't think it would be appropriate and they are already overburdened and mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately they have not been able to uh, perform their own uh, duties um, as well as they should uh faratullah babar sahab let me ask you uh was there any discussion on this aspect mm. who should be uh assigned the responsibility to investigate torture because uh, uh let me also refer to uh the uh, remarkable uh, amendments uh, introduced by pakistan people's party's uh, government in 2010 uh in which a lot of devolution uh, took place from federation to the provinces so um, if we are to rely on fia which i think was also the case with your bill uh, you also nominated uh, fia as the investigating agency for torture uh, uh, is it an appropriate forum well when uh, was there any discussion was yeah. there any interaction it, with the provinces at that stage uh, well you know the the most important thing in this for, for investigation was that there should be a specialized agency there should be a specialized mm -hmm. agency and there was a discussion internal discussion on this uh, particular year that which department should be approached where mm -hmm. the complainant will go and uh, well of course there were very strong reasons that it should be a separate department has to be set up and for which there has to be a separate law also now why was it why in my bill we went for the fia or the sessions court that either the complainant goes to the fia or to the sessions court uh, because we thought at that time that after internal discussions that if we have to wait for the setting up of another specialized agency it might take ages we thought that well the bill is ready and the government of the day is also interested and it will pass and let us try this and because if we wait uh, we might not be able to uh, get this uh, anti torture legislation passed or implemented in the long run at that time we did not visualize it didn't cross our thought mind that it will even after a decade even after uh, even after not having a separate department for investigations and for lodging complaints uh, we will not be able to do that it was i think a miscalculation but nonetheless a provision was made that complaints will be made to fia or complaints will be made to the session court and the important thing that was made in that law was that illegal detention torture etc no defense that there is emergency or the nation is at war or anything like that this will not constitute defense this was a very major development in that bill and we thought that all right there were checks and balances i don't recall exactly but of course uh, we had given a thought to this so in our bill it was either the fia or the uh, the session court it would go and we had also made some other very uh, uh, good things in that that uh, no female uh, could be uh, detained and information extracted under torture was uh, declared illegal so i think uh, whether it was fia or the sessions court the important thing really was not as to have a separate agency or not the important thing was to provide a, a legal framework and to get the bill passed and to and to get going the bill was passed in the senate but it could not because when it was sent to the national assembly and in the national assembly 
the rule is, the law says that if it is not passed by the other house in 90 days, then uh, the mover or anybody can move a, a, a motion in the house from which it was originated, uh, urging that it should be sent to the joint session of the parliament. I said, Jamal Sahib, I still don't know what happened. It was a motion was passed by the Senate that this bill should be taken up in the joint session. At the same time, we had also moved a motion in the Senate that anti-rape bill and the anti-honor killing bill, which had been passed in the Senate earlier, but had not been passed in 90 days by the National Assembly, that also was moved to the joint session. Those were the bills moved initially by Senator Sora Imam. But since her tenure ended, I took up the ownership and I moved the uh, private this motion and it was taken up in the joint session and it was passed. Both the anti-tarch, anti-honor killing, anti-rape bill, both were passed in the joint session after some give and take and after some negotiation. Somehow, somehow the anti-torture bill did not come up. I really don't know where, how did it disappear in the, in the dark corridors? In the maze, I did not know. So I think that that was uh, that is what had happened. Uh, you already had pointed out, and I missed commenting on that. And you said the culture of tolerance. Well, of course, apart from the political thing, the society also condones torture. A society which yields for public hanging, and voices are raised in the parliament that so when people like this should be hanged in public or when you know uh, the highest people in the land also talk of you know hanging at the doorstep or when the police officers acknowledge in private that they prefer to run private uh, jails uh, then of course this is an issue of the society also thank you I think, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Farazul uh, Babasa. I think uh, another uh, dimension uh, is the police accountability. Whenever we talk about police reform, uh, we forget uh, police accountability. And uh, despite uh, several uh, attempts at holding police accountable under a particular specific law, uh, uh, we haven't really succeeded. So I think it's not just this security establishment, uh, as Rima pointed out, that holding state agents accountable by the state itself and holding them criminally liable is something which the state uh, agents, uh, the, the state authorities don't like. And uh, this is one of the major impediments which we uh, face mm. in the region and internationally. Um, I think um, uh, we need to, uh, you know, uh, start thinking out of the box and uh, start introducing, at least debating, uh, uh, alternative uh, mechanism for accountability of police and other state agents. Uh, for instance, uh, it would be uh, probably worth considering uh, whether we should have at the provincial level uh, police ombudspersons institution. Uh, this is something which I, I don't think we have seriously uh, given any serious consideration in the past. Uh, is Fatma Bukhari still with us? Yes, okay. I'm here. Oh, all right. Fatma, um, can you throw some light? Um, because you raised a number of questions, but we have very limited time. Now we have only a couple of minutes to, uh, you know, wind up our uh, discussion. Um, uh, this aspect of holding accountable through a particular agency, uh, what are your views? Can, can Are there any alternatives? So, so you know, as uh, other panelists uh, mentioned as well, this is, a, this is something that... We we will have to have a very serious and perhaps a long-term engagement and a consultative process that will come to identify this. I think globally, not just in, in, in our region, people are still trying to work out different models for police accountability. Uh, one of the publications that I can recommend that lays out some best practices in this regard, where they look at 11 countries across the world to see what is the role of independent investigative agencies and what are some of the potential criteria that they should have uh, in, you know, kind of meeting effectiveness uh, or impartiality and related criteria for investigation. It's who polices the police, uh, the role of in independent investigative agencies. It's a briefing paper uh, that's come up with uh, from the Open Society Justice Initiative, and they provide 10 indicators against which you can measure 
um, you know, any particular kind of model uh, in terms of an investigative agency. I personally believe that, um, and that's what the briefing paper also suggests based on their experience with the review, is that exclusive jurisdiction is important uh, for accountability for serious crimes such as torture and enforced disappearances. Um, an institutional framework that uh, spreads accountability uh, oversight or investigation in multiple jurisdictions, in multiple different institutions, is likely to have the problem of uh, enforcement. Um, so there needs to be exclusive jurisdiction. Similarly, other criteria can be that the leadership needs to be assured through fixed terms, through protections against early dismissals, through protection against harassment, which we know that our judges and National Commission Human Rights uh, heads have not had. Uh, so these kinds of things have to be thought about when we're looking at either an existing uh, institution that we want to give this responsibility to, or we're thinking of conceptualizing a new one. And I think what Senator Barber said is extremely important, that when we look at our existing framework, one of the problems that we do see that's not limited to this legislation is other legislation as well, is that we have a tendency to create new institutions under any new legislation. But what happens is that we don't have the necessary will and resources to allocate to that institution. Rule making is terribly delayed, uh, which doesn't, you know, for a long time, we don't know what the bodies or the definitions that are provided under the legislation actually mean in practice. So I think it's very important to be cognizant of our experience with new creating new institutions when we think about that as well. But simultaneously look at regional and international best practices from an indicator point of view on how to measure um, you know, success, which is something that, you know, is being done across the world, because this is a huge issue that how do you police or, or hold accountable those who are responsible uh, for, you know, some kind of uh, policing function or the state security apparatus. So I think there are two problems. One, that there is an absence of a legal framework which leads to lack of protection with regards to torture, with regards to enforced disappearances, uh, which both need legislation in its own right. And then there's a problem of existing legislation and legal framework, which has been highlighted in the counterterrorism security context, that hinders, uh, you know, access to basic guards, uh, safeguards, which also has to be reviewed. That's a distinct issue than the lack of legislation. It's the presence of legislation which is causing the problems as well that has to be reviewed. Similarly, there is an absence of an institutional framework that is causing problems, but at the same time, there is a a problem with sufficient allocation or giving up of powers to existing institutions that are mandated under different laws right now to provide some kind of a um, you know, legal safeguard function against torture and other forms of ill treatment. For example, the Commission on Enforced Disappearances. So we have to look at it uh, from these both lenses when we, when we try to see what we're looking at because accountability for torture encompasses much wider things as Rima mentioned when we're looking at prevention, we're looking at compensation. And here, while we wait for the law, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that we have had uh, you know, judgments come out from the Supreme Court and the High Court. They are exceptional in, in situations, but our courts assume broad jurisdiction with regards to granting remedies. And they have uh, held, at least on paper through judgments, senior officials from military and other accountable, uh, rolled out disciplinary proceedings, even asked for initiation of criminal proceedings, but and also given large uh, sums for compensation, but implementation and also just the how applicable is that and how widespread is that effect going to be something that we need to look at uh, in the interim while we're waiting for uh, legislation to, to kind of begin a more holistic introspection. So this is just briefly what I would suggest and I can share the link in, in the chat box uh, here as well. Thank you so much. This could be uh, the best uh, conclusion, uh, conclusive remarks, I think. Uh, let, but let me ask a couple of questions um, uh, to Nicole and uh, Rima. Um, in fact, my question is that how do we change culture? How, how, how is that going to happen? Rima, would you like to address this question since you raised the <laughs> issue of culture? and acceptance of uh, torture as a cultural uh, characteristic? Oh, Asad, you're asking me for uh, very... Um, I, I can't really give one answer to this, but the first thing has to be a recognition on the state's part uh, that this is important. It's something that has to be done. And, um, you know, so for, for example, right now, when we're calling on parliament to enact a law, we have to give this 
emphasis and we have to give this some sort of focus and work with the media i mean work with there's so many platforms now that can help um change uh, people's attitudes and people's perceptions um so that has to be it has to be done at all levels but it has to be an emphasis i mean that would be my um sort of recommendation that when we say criminalized torture we add to it other hashtags and other parts in the advocacy uh that also uh, you know relate to these other aspects of torture that we've spoken about thank you so uh, much i think uh, we need to have a larger debate and we need to change the direction of discourse uh, faratullah babar sahab you want to add to it something <coughs> yeah in addition to what uh, reema said you know uh, cultural changes it's a long drawn process but in the first step what we can do what the state can do is that in all the training academies of the police and the law enforcing agencies we should introduce courses in constitution in human rights and in due process right now there are no they, they don't even know what are human rights and what is due process if he can have syllabi in these academic institutions i think that is the first important step in my view of course uh, governmental uh, culture is also something which we need to look into and we need to find out what kind of trainings are being given to police officials and other state authorities in uh, you know different uh, uh, agencies and uh, at different levels I mean, uh, provincial can i just as add as one something some, yes, sure, some small absolutely. point absolutely i mean it really worries me when our parliamentarians advocate torture uh, on the floor of the house and we've seen that done by so many of them repeatedly yeah. and they are considered assets so i mean at the same time when your minister for human rights a lot of respect for her um is talking about criminalizing torture and focusing on enacting a new law and how serious pakistan is about its international obligations her colleague in the cabinet is saying people should be tied up to jeeps and you know dragged on the roads before being publicly hanged that's a huge issue and i think when it comes to uh, perceptions mindsets culture this is it right there so yeah. let's start with accountability maybe in parliament for people who call for torture like this yeah definitely it seriously negatively impacts uh, cultural mindset uh, nicole pakistan is supposed to submit its next report by may this year how important it is yes that's right the, the next periodic report is due um this may um these type of reportings before the un uh, committee against torture are very important it is considered um a dialogue between the 10 cat members the 10 experts and the government um of pakistan and usually in these in these dialogues um the cat together with the government delegation they explore as to how the government what the government needs to do to implement the convention and something i wanted to mention also is the good thing about the convention is that the way the provisions are laid out it's it is already a blueprint as to how to eradicate torture all the necessary um provisions regulations are there in the convention so everything is laid out already um and in the dialogue between the the committee and the government um the the um the committee will stress what steps the government needs to take um they will explore what are the difficulties um what's the specific political cultural and so on situation of a country um that's limiting implementation so it are these things that are discussed so so it it is important that the government submits um its periodical report so that these type of discussions uh, can take place uh we hope that government of pakistan will take uh, this uh, deadline seriously and uh, we will enter the next uh, phase of uh, holding the government of pakistan accountable at the inter international yes. fora uh thank you so much thank you reema umar uh, faratullah babar saab uh, fatma bukhari and nicole uh it's been uh, enriching and enlightening uh, i hope our discussion reaches uh in the corridors of uh, uh, you know government and uh, the uh, powers that be 
and they take some cues from uh, this discussion and uh, start uh, talking about uh, implementing the United Nations Convention Against Torture and also uh, uh, start uh, trying uh, to give a new uh, direction to uh, the, the, the national discourse. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, definitely be returning to this subject uh, uh, in a few weeks' time uh, once again. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.